Good evening. I call to order the meeting of the mayor and the board of trustees of the village of Burr Ridge for February 27. Um, and I'm going to ask Mr. Eddie Shisham to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Eddie. Roll call, please. Trustee Francis. Here. Trustee Schiappa. Here. Trustee Paveza. Here. Trustee Snyder. Here. Trustee Mattel. Here. Trustee Smith. Here. Mayor Grasso. Here. <clears throat> Trustee Snyder did give me uh, advanced proper notice that he would not be able to make it tonight. Uh, he would have been able to call in if he was at a place to call in, but he said he wouldn't be able to call in. So, uh, But he did uh, let me know well in advance. Um, that takes us to item three, presentations and public hearings. We have none tonight. Item four, the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered routine by the board <clears throat> and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or citizen requests, in which event the item will be removed from the consent agenda, discussed, open for public comment, and voted upon during this meeting. Five minutes. A, approval of regular board meeting of February 13, 2023. B, approval of special board meeting of February 15, 2023. Six, there are no ordinances. Seven, uh, resolutions A, Approval of a resolution appropriating village funds to construct the Wolf Road pedestrian crossing improvements with joint funding from the Safe Routes to School Grant. Eight considerations. D, approval of Mayor Grasso's nomination of Edward Schism as the commissioner on the Board of Fire and Police Commission for a term expiring April 30, 2025. <clears throat> E, receive and file notice of withdrawal of zoning petition Z26-2022-525 Village Center Drive, AT&T. And F, approval of vendor list dated February 27, 2023 in the amount of $503,634.74 for all funds, plus $206,018.71 for payroll period ending February 18, 2023 for a grand total of $709,653.45. Can I get a motion to approve the following items on the consent agenda? 5A and B, 7A, 8D, E, and F. So moved. Second. Any discussion uh, by the trustees? Any discussion <coughs> by any members in the public, in the audience? Roll call, please. Trustee Schiappa? Yes. Trustee Paveza? Yes. Trustee Mattel? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Pave Francis? Yes. 5 0. 5 0, the motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Schism. <coughs> um, 8A, consideration to accept and file the resignation of Board of Fire and Police Commissioner Ronald Damper. Police Chief Madden, how are you, sir? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Good evening, everybody. I'm honored to address you tonight and talk about Mr. Ron Damper. A little bit about the BFPC before I start, the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. Commissioners appointed to the Village of Burr Ridge Board of Fire and Police Commission have the statutory authority to hire, terminate probationary officers, and promote police officers to the rank of sergeant. Prior to 2012, the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners conducted dis disciplinary hearings for officers charged with violations related to policy and conduct violations. That changed in 2012 by collective bargaining agreement where the discipline for non-probationary officers is handled by the Chief of Police. Mr. Ron Damper, who's sitting right here in the front row, was appointed commissioner in August, 20, uh, August 27th of 2001. During his 22 years of service, he's interviewed hundreds of police applicants. I actually think it's in the thousands because we used to have testing with 200 applicants. 
and they would be responsible to go through all those applicants when the time came. Mr. Damper has hired 88% of the officers on the department today. That's all but three, me being one of the three. He's also attended department meetings. He volunteered to uh, attend our department meetings to address the sworn officers on topics that police officers face every day, including diversity. I was just in roll call a half hour ago, and they were bringing that up, how they enjoyed when you, and when you came to the meetings and had great discussions. I've worked with Ron for 20 of the 22 years. On behalf of the men and women of the police department, thank you for all of your years of service, Ron, and for all of your hard work. It has been a pleasure to work with you during the past 20 years. And I'm glad I got to be here tonight. I'm glad you were able to make it tonight. Thank you for keeping it off the consent agenda. And I don't know, Mr. Damper, did you want to say anything? I can't talk. But I want to say that it's really good, everything. And it really helped us. And we have a great purse. Yes. And you all let live that all the time. And I look at it all the time. Everything that are going around here, I think we are the best here. And I thank everybody for you who are dead, okay? Yeah. I the stroke and I I'll go I'll be better by the end of this year. Well, he, I think he's doing very I really good. <laughs> hope it will better. I thank it, okay? Thank you so I much. I hope you don't don't be a stranger. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. You want oh, she wants to <laughs> That can I get a motion to accept and file the resignation of Board of Fire and Police Commissioner Ronald Damp. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Again, Ron, oh, yeah. thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all the residents of the village of Burr Ridge, one of the reasons we are a very special place is because of your service and are uh, giving us a great police department. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item 8B, consideration of draft fiscal year 2024, fiscal year to 2028 capital improvement plan. Evan? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here with staff tonight to present the last item in our budget planning process. Uh, if you've been reading my emails, the budget will be coming out this Friday, March 3rd, for draft discussion, and will be on the next board agenda, March 13th. Our meeting will be at 6 p.m. to discuss the entire draft budget. However, we wanted to get a little advanced direction from the board to make sure we were on the right track for what is easily the largest and sometimes most complicated funding element of the budget, which is our capital plan. So that is what we'll be in part discussing tonight uh, with this presentation. I want to begin by discussing the FY 2023 capital improvement plan, some of the major things we did in that. We had a little bit of a down year just in terms of spending. That's kind of how capital plans work. You have up years, down years, just based on funding availability. The four major items we did were the annual road program, we we're about $160,000 under budget, as you saw in the last couple meetings, due to some work which was not needed to happen. We were also proud to complete two major sidewalk and pathway improvements for our community. Garfield Avenue sidewalk connection, a new sidewalk was placed on the east side of the road. Really nice facility for residents on that side of town. And we replaced the entirety of the Cramel Drive pathway replacement. Originally, we thought these would be about $420,000, but due to some good, uh, pricing, uh, and some unnecessary work we didn't have to undertake. We were about $60,000 under budget. So that money went back into the capital fund to help pay for future investments. And finally, one of the more under the radar projects was the police station access control systems. If you've been in our police department, it's a series of locks, cameras, TVs, um, a number of things which ultimately go on to make our police station work normally. Uh, this was original to the building, so it had been about 15 years since replaced, and we got all new technology in our building 
to make it just that much safer and more productive for all of our officers. So we had a little bit more of a truncated FY 2023, ended up spending about $2 million in total in FY 2023. But as you can see in FY 2024, we're planning to significantly increase that to almost $7 million. Um, I'm gonna have uh, our staff come up and do some presentations at this time about exactly what we're gonna spend those on, but we have a pretty diverse uh, array of uh, projects that we're gonna be working on this year with your direction. So at this point, I'm gonna have Dave start us off with our FY 2024 CIP. Go ahead, Dave, thank you. In the coming fiscal year, 2024, um, you know, we talked about two, uh, two weeks ago at our board meeting, the annual road program. Uh, this year, we're resurfacing that Devon Ridge subdivision. Um, or not Devon Ridge, sorry, the Devon Elkhorn Ridge subdivision. Uh, that's, our, that's our primary focus. And then it's other pavement rehabilitation projects, a little bit of engineering on 83rd Street in advance of next year. Um, so that's a total. Um, so again, we're moving forward with those. We've got the Wolf Road Pedestrian Crossing Improvements Project. You, you just had the resolution approving that to go forward. 80% of that is funded by the Safe Routes to School Grant Program. The other 20%, which is our local match, is gonna be split between the Pleasantdale Park District and the Pleasantdale um, School District 107. So that's um, gonna be a great community project. Again, Safe Routes to School is funding the majority of that. Um, 79th Street Pathway Improvements. Now here's a project to replace the asphalt path on the south side of 79th Street. Um, at the same time, we had that engineering firm look at what it would be to connect on the north side. Um, so he'd come up with, uh, they've come up with an estimate for that north pathway addition that's from Chasemore, uh, where we built that connection for the borough plan to Chasemore five years ago, six years ago, and then the connection over to the pathway from Ambrance. Between Ambrance and Chasemore, it goes up to Lincolnshire Drive and the Pace bus routes. Um, construction engineering will be budgeted in there as well. So that's a preliminary number. We haven't had that fully designed yet on the north side, um, but that's probably a worst case, we, we hope. Um, so again, south is just an asphalt pathway replacement. That's about 2,600 feet. Uh, the north pathway is a quite a bit shorter, um, but there's a lot more work that's going to be involved. That again also includes a flashing pedestrian beacon, with the crossing of Woodside Lane, you know, as, as requested. Um, so we're working with uh, Cook County Highway Department on, on uh, securing that right away. So just one note on that: uh, we originally brought that to your attention last year, thinking it'd probably be about three years away. We're exploring putting that with Chase Moore on their private property through an easement and it will bring the construction schedule up significantly in terms of availability. So that could be let in FY24, should we get that availability, just move it two or three feet north. Um, same pathway, same connection, but much faster uh, in response to our residents. Good to know. Then you're not in the FY2024 CIP. Um, now focusing a little bit on buildings and here at the Village Hall um, through a Cook County uh, Department of Homeland Security grant, um, you know, replacing the, the, the window here that, that was plastic really just for the, the COVID pandemic um, with something that's a little more bullet resistant. Um, that's to match kind of what's across the street um, with our police department. Uh, and just a safety factor that we can enhance with the grant. Uh, over at the police department, um, yes, the building's only 12 years old, but the HVAC is, is declined uh, to the point that it needs to be replaced. Um, it also was uh, kind of deficient almost when it was put in, but um, with some upgrades now, we can um, replace and mitigate the, the issues that we're having at various spots of the building that, that were uncovered over the last 12 years. We tried our best to, to have small spot improvements, but what really needs it is a complete almost overhaul throughout the building with the HVAC improvements. Um, also, we're going to paint the interior and exterior. It's time again. Last time that was done was 2016 uh, when we did the village hall and the police department. Um, so before the, the wood deteriorates again, we want to make sure that we coat those at the same time. Then on the stormwater, um, it, were there any questions on the buildings, I guess, before we go on to stormwater? And then you've heard about this one for a long time, the Elm Street culvert. Um, we've got that grant for, for the construction of that. Uh, we're going to have $30,000 in the next fiscal year for continuing with the design engineering. However, the project in its entirety won't be built until the, next, the following fiscal year. And you get into the, the detailed design, they've uncovered that there are several utility conflicts, uh, one of which being a NICOR gas main that needs to be relocated. NICOR has to take some time now to engineer, to construct uh, the design, and then construct its, its main replacement. We ran into that with like German Church Road, the sidewalk several years ago, so it takes them about a year. Um, so it has no impact on our grant, 
um, but the stormwater improvements will have to be pushed out to, to next summer. Uh, not this current summer, we're, you know, we always anticipate trying to get this done in the summertime so we don't impact the school. We've got to push that out in March. We'd let the school board know. We'll do. Yes, sir. Has the uh, relocation of the NICOR gas line affected the cost of the project at all? That's, is that out of, out of NICOR's pocket? Um, it, it, you mean pushing it out another year? Will that affect the, the no, our, our project costs? No. No, it does the NICOR oh. repair impact our end of the No, we're cost. not responsible for NICOR's <clears throat> No, Thank thanks. You. That's a good question. Yeah. We're not responsible for NICOR's money. So moving on again. Um, in the water fund. All right, in, in the fiscal year 2024 water sewer fund. The Woodview uh, Road, South Drive, Gregford Road, we've heard a little bit about. That's up on the north end of town, um, adjacent to the Tartan Ridge development. That became our highest priority for water main replacements. Um, as we went through our water hydraulic model, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides later. Um, but this became the priority for water main replacements. In <coughs> um, so that, that comes at a cost. And that's fully in design. We anticipate that construction uh, all of this coming year going forward with that. The South Water Tower has been on the radar for some time. Um, there's a process involved in uh, the, the design and the bids are, gonna, are going to happen. But there's also cellular equipment that has to come off. Um, so the timing of something like that would be cellular equipment off this summer, um, decommission the thing uh, over the winter time, uh, sand and, and paint the inside, sand and paint the outside when the temperatures allow in spring of next year. So all in this fiscal year, We'll be painting that South Water Tower. That's our next one. That's the one next to Double Good, off of 83rd Street, um, as a point of reference. It's our 300,000 gallon water tower. We call our South Water Tower. <coughs> and that's in We've got the Justice Middle Springs uh, interconnect. It's the second interconnect uh, underneath the I-294. Um, that 146,000 is a is a portion of a $700,000 project. The tollway is covering most of that because that interconnect benefits them in staging some other work. Um, that they've got to take the Justice Willow Springs water lines down. So having that interconnect is going to benefit us to increase pressures, um, redundant systems for um, should another, uh, should our Bedford Park main go down. We've got that second interconnect with Justice Willow Springs, um, largely at the cost of the tollway. So that was a great IGA that we did a year ago. And then other related projects you'll see in the back of the packet um, will be coming out of the water fund. And in the sewer fund, so in conjunction with that water main project we just spoke of up on the north end of town, um, we did uh, closed circuit television on this back in 2019 on that section of sewer to identify where there's cracks or breaks in that uh, almost 60 year old sewer main. Um, also, in addition, uh, you know, we just did smoke testing there in that same area of town just this past uh, last year. So we've identified that there will be areas of repair. Why not do it at the same time as a water main project? So we budgeted some funds in the sewer fund to do that at the same time. Um, what came up then also with our inflow infiltration control program study is that our two um, primary sanitary lift stations should also have inspected their, uh, their force mains. This is, you know, the lift station is collecting that sanitary sewage, pushing it up to a higher point. That force main um, we should really be conditioning that thing like we were doing it with our water mains um, because a main break on, on, a, on a force main is not a good day. So, no, not to joke about it, but it, uh, it, does, it is a critical piece of infrastructure. So we do uh, anticipate having assessments on those to program for any other repairs that need to happen at that time. And then the, um, just a piece of equipment in our, in our shop is um, deteriorated to the point of operation, but we do want to have this for just maintaining sewers. It's our sewer jetter trailer. Uh, so we budgeted for that and have a sewer fund in this fiscal year. Take any questions? Have any questions? <clears throat> Anybody from the audience have any questions? Okay, next. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm just going to talk through the revenue sources, but I think the most important thing to point out is, as Evan said, we have almost a $7 million capital plan for next year, which includes absolutely no debt funding, which is a significant feat for any municipality. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through what the different funding sources are. Um, we are going to use the remainder of the ARPA funds that the village received to fund uh, the 79th Street Rehab Project as well as some water uh, 
water fund projects, water main projects, that will utilize the full $1.463 million that we received in ARPA funds. Um, we have a $200,000 uh, DCEO grant <coughs> that is going to be utilized to partially fund the painting of the water tower. Um, the IDOT uh, amount that we're receiving, the 130, I think Dave touched on it already, that's going to fund the Wolf Road ped path that he just talked about. We've got the safety grant, which once again, Dave mentioned, is going to fund the safety glass here in Village Hall. Um, General Fund has enough fund balance to be able to transfer a significant, significant portion of it to the Capital Improvement Fund, as well as to fund projects within the General Fund while still maintaining a very healthy general fund balance with using those funds for capital. Uh, based upon the rate study that we recently did that Evan's gonna talk about in a few minutes, we've got sufficient fund balances within the water fund to fund about the two point, uh, what is it here? $3.2 million in water fund projects. Um, so we've got the, the healthy reserves there, our rates are going to cover those expenditures. Sewer fund, same thing. We've got enough fund balance in that fund to cover the sewer fund uh, projects that are budgeted for next year while still maintaining a decent fund balance in that fund. Hotel Motel, we do transfer money every month, or I'm sorry, every year out of that fund to fund capital. I believe it's 25% of the revenue of that fund that we transfer out. Capital Improvement Fund actually has a really healthy fund balance. Um, we're able to utilize about a million for of it for fiscal year 2024. But at the end of 2024, there's still gonna be about a million dollar fund balance in that fund that we'll be able to use in future years. Um, and then just as Dave had touched on, there's a small reimbursement that we're gonna receive from the park district and the school district to partially fund that Wolf Road ped path. So once again, these are the funding sources, and I think the most important thing is that there's no debt included in any of these, any of this funding. And the village remains debt free. Yes. Um, and one other point before you move on: <clears throat> all the ARPA, ARPA money, about one point one point four million four, approximately, <clears throat> was all used for capital improvements. Absolutely, it had to be. Absolutely. I just want the residents to understand that yep. it was used appropriately and for the, uh, the correct things. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so just our summary, looking for any direction you may have. If you're going to confirm this, we'll put it into the budget for Friday's release. Uh, if you want to make any changes, now's a good time. We certainly can make changes later on. Uh, we're just going to do some final review and audit of the budget this, this week before we go to publish. Again, just want to note the overall financial architecture of our village is strong, resilient, and flexible. Um, there is a significant surplus uh, in the general fund in 23 and 24. There's also uh, big fund balances in the capital improvement fund. Um, so we're, we're bringing this to you, as Anne Marie said, debt free, continue to be debt free, but pay for a lot of proactive amenities that the residents um, have been asking for over the last couple of years at this point. I'll turn yeah, it back two over things. I'd, I'd, and before anybody has a comment, I um, want to watch what we're putting into this building because um, I hope to come forward to the board with a, another idea <clears throat> for a village hall. Uh, so I want to be as conservative as uh, possible in this next fiscal year about any improvements in this building. Um, and then uh, we, of course, want to look for some funds for the police pension. Absolutely. Um, as we work through our budget process. Um, those are my two comments. Uh, anybody, uh, any of the trustees want to make any comments at this point? Yes. This is a good, well thought out path forward and I support it 100%. I thank you all staff for sharpening your pencils, keeping things under budget and for being fiscally responsible and also looking towards the future. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just wanted to applaud the staff for working hard to come up with such a nice budget. This is what makes Burrit such a special place. We're very proactive. We get bids early. We make repairs when they're needed. And so we save money down the road. Um, so I just wanted to uh, applaud them for doing such a good job. Thank you. And there's been a general um, how should we say it? Um, the spirit has been um, throughout the year of law of no surprises. Right. Um, they, you know, planning uh, and uh, looking forward, not just suddenly jumping in at budget time. Right. So there has been under uh, obviously um, Evan's direction, uh, we have uh, been watching uh, the dollars um, as we started to do almost on a daily basis when COVID hit. So that may be another kind, if there's a benefit from COVID, that might be one of the fiscal benefits that we had. 
And so we have been operating on the uh, ideology of the law of no surprises. And I think you're starting to see the uh, result of that. Um, and you'll see it uh, in specifics when we get to the budget. Yes, Russ. So I tend to look down the road a little bit, and I notice um, that fiscal 2027, we've got another big number, almost seven million. Evan, if you could just kind of maybe explain, obviously there, there was a lot of work put into that. How is that going to get paid for? What's kind of the planning process there? No, good question. So uh, one of the things I want to note as well, yes, we do have a $7 million number in there, and about two-thirds of that is in the water system improvements. If you look at this page, there's a line that says water system improvements TBD $1.5 million, and that is unplanned capacity that we have. That's a result of the next budget item that we'll be talking about, which is that the new rate structure that we'll be proposing when we're through at this discussion will give us significant operating capacity without the need for significant water rate increases in the future. So we are going to have, I mean, let's say we don't use that in any capacity for any reason. That number comes down to 5.5-ish .5 million dollars, certainly still a larger than average number, but we have that capacity to use as we like for projects that are necessary. Um, I don't see any other significant projects in there, but um, there is a significant amount of this being water oriented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> any questions from the public? All right, that takes us to HC, <clears throat> consideration of five-year water and sewer rate plan. Thank okay. you, Mayor, I'll pick this up. <clears throat> so this is the end result of a significant amount of work, direction, thought, oh, nice evening, uh, that has been placed uh, before you tonight um, at the direction of the Water Committee. Trustees Paveza, Francis, and Snyder have spent a lot of nights with staff reviewing water and sewer rates, the most fun job you can have in the village. But I think we've come up with an idea and a recommendation that is supported by science and makes fiscal sense for the village and its residents. Uh, and I'm very excited to present um, this five-year water and sewer rate model here tonight. All right, thanks, Evan. Yeah, this does kind of culminate a, a consultant-led study, um, staff-led study with a consultant since 2020. Um, it was really a, a four-part. We whittled it down to three-part study. First was using a hydraulic water model to analyze our, our system qualitatively um, for any deficiencies where water main break are concentrated um, and to help us prioritize then projects going forward. Um, the second was the water rate model was part of that study. Um, uh, and, and the third was the uh, development of the capital plan. So starting off first with the uh, recommended water main improvements after developing then that water hydraulic model, um, it was a really neat study of finding out areas where flows were and how things worked in our system. We then found that there were some areas that were operating poorly. Uh, they just did not have the, the critical pressures in emergencies that we would need. And one of those primarily is what we just talked about, the, the wood, uh, wood view. Uh, Gregford area up there, A1, A2, A3, or AA1, A2, and A3. Um, that doesn't meet the fire flow re uh, requirements. That um, doesn't lack redundancy. If you look at that little segment A and that little segment A3, should a water main break occur up there, um, we've shut off about 156 homes, plus or minus. Um, that's another boil order for a large neighborhood up there. So having that water main replaced with a uh, larger main, um, developing some parallel mains, having a connection through um, the King Brewer homes uh, gets us that redundancy that we needed. Um, so that became the first priority. Carriageway, of course, we've been hearing up for a number of years. It's had five, six, even up to seven water main breaks in a year. Um, that has the heat map of water main uh, breaks to fix. So that neighborhood became secondary to the life safety issues up north. So that's um, planned in FY 2026. Future years, again, these are just placeholders based on what the system tells us for now. Um, so future years out, we've got 73rd, 74th over on the east side of town in Pleasant View, um, and then there's other projects going forward. All told about $12 million over the next um, five-year cycle in water main replacements. And the water fund is expected to fund most of this? It will fund all this. Right. Okay, yep. okay and that's because of the planning of the water committee. And ultimately approved by this board. 
Uh, and just so some of the residents also begin to understand um, that the water increase uh, rates that we often get are imposed uh, because of the city of Chicago. Uh, you guys maybe know how it works better. But often we're just bringing forward rates that we're getting increases from Chicago and, and um, right? And Bedford Park. And Bedford Park, right. Okay. Um, any questions on, on this five-year plan? Again, this is what good planning. Um, appreciate it. Any questions in the audience? Audience is dwindling. Uh, so we must be doing something right tonight again. <laughs> All right, so that takes us um, through the uh, five-year water and sewer rate plan. And now we're at item nine, public comment. Yeah. We have a little bit more to go on this oh, one. You do? You don't okay, mind. I'm sorry. Nope, all good. So currently our rate structure has uh, two different charges. We have a fixed charge that's bi-monthly, $10 every other month for residential, $20 every other month for non-residential customers. This is pretty consistent with what other communities charge in the region just to provide some fixed revenue. Then we have a volume charge with inclining bi-monthly block water rates. So if you were to use 10,000 gallons a month, you'd be getting $20,000, a 20,000 gallon uh, usage bill based on our current bi-monthly rates. Um, the average resident is using about eight to 10,000 gallons per month right now. Um, so the average resident is about 75% of our residents are in tier one is an easy way to summarize it. Uh, we are recommending a PAYGO financing approach over the next five years. Um, as asked by Tristy Shop earlier today, PAYGO is a government term for using cash to pay for current obligations and, and operations. So we looked at a PAYGO approach and a debt financing approach. PAYGO basically says we'll charge enough to bring in enough cash to pay for the operations and improvements, while debt obviously would bring in a significant <coughs> lump sum, but it would need to be repaid back over a significant period of time. We found that overall PAYGO would re require a lower financing rate because it could spread the charges out over a larger period of time, while not significantly affecting our rate of how much work we can do. Um, and the other benefit is we're not paying to borrow money at the current rates we're at right now. That would add a significant amount of charge, thus that'd be the extra rates that we'd be having to put in place. So we're recommending a 7%, 5%, 5%, 5%, and 3% kind of beyond there, 28 plus uh, rate increases, plus any net increases that would come through CPI from Bedford Park, which is usually about 2%. Now this is actually less than the five-year rate increases that were put in place in 2018. We're looking at about tens and eights for five years that we just went through. So this is significantly cheaper than the rate increases we just went through uh, with the community. And again, our rates would remain about the median of all DuPage County communities through FY 2028. Over about 35 communities, we averaged about a 5% increase over the next five years. We conservatively went between about 15 to 20th out of 35 communities, just depending on where we were in the structure. So we would remain pretty competitive overall. Secondarily, we'd be shifting from a bi-monthly to a fun monthly fixed charge while lowering the tier windows over four years, leveling off in FY 2027. The board, as you know, has approved a project called Automated Metering Infrastructure, AMI, to allow for much greater metering accuracy for all of our residents, as well as a lot of our commercial customers getting new meters. That'll both allow for more of the build water, more of the unbilled water that's slipping through the meter to be billed by us accurately, as well as track any leaks which may be occurring at our customers to save them money uh, down the road once that's in place. Again, the vast majority of our residential users who are in Tier 1 and FY23 would remain in Tier 1 going forward. We designed it that way. But Tier 2 and Tier 3 customers are basically people who are going to be watering their lawn every day, filling the swimming pool, washing the car, really having discretionary water usage. Um, tier 1 is bathing, uh, cleaning, um, drinking, all the things that you would normally do on a daily basis that would be, we would describe as basic, normal water usage. Um, and then finally, um, oh, as I said, we would be leveling that off in FY 2027. So again, if you're wondering, the first month was zero to 70,000 and now it's zero to 35,000. That's because the rose rates would be going from two months to one month. So we're basically cutting the quantities in half because we'll be going to a monthly billing structure. That was the water fund. The sewer rate is a little bit easier. It's a fixed charge. We're recommending an increase of $5 per month per bill per year. So in FY24, it goes up $5. FY25, it goes up $5, and so on. This fund is a lot smaller. The projects come up a little less often, but because we only service a small part of the community, 
having big projects can be harder to finance. So we're trying to build up some of that fund balance now for what we think will be a lot more work in seven to 10 years and ultimately avoid any large increases in the future or possibly even special assessments. Mm -hmm. We think this will avoid all that and really make the sewer fund work. The sewer fund currently has over a million dollar fund balance, but that can go really quick depending on how big the project can be because this is such specific work along with the water fund. Again, our summary recommendation for both the water and sewer fund fully accounts for CMT's five-year water improvement recommendation. It's cash finance and provides $1.5 million annually for water distribution projects in FY28 and beyond. It creates a 90-day fund balance policy after FY24, as well as the sewer fund. And we also are recommending we do this again in FY27 just to make sure we remain on level footing going forward. Through a lot of information that you right there. Just let me know if you have any questions. So one of the, and I haven't gotten calls in a while, but it was frequently that I did calls on people who suddenly got a large water bill because they were away for the holidays or the toilet was running or mm -hmm. something, and I haven't been getting those calls. It's a good thing. <clears throat> so what have we been doing to um, make it safer for the residents not to be filled with unexpected uh, water Problems. This year, uh, our public works department's been working well with our finance department. Uh, we have new people in both water and finance who are helping out a lot with creating work orders and being proactive to go out and fix those issues. So if we find there's an issue with the meter that's not being measured correctly, we work together to make sure that we have those work orders scheduled to go out within a day or two to make sure that the meter is working properly. If it's not, the meter comes right out to make sure that you're getting built properly. In the future, the thing that will really be helpful is AMI. AMI is going to allow for real-time, everyday reads if necessary planning on once a month on a normal billing cycle, but if we are seeing a spike, we will be able to communicate proactively with residents to say, your water usage is up 500% from yesterday. We're just making sure that there's no issue. If there is, great. Uh, if there is not, we advise you check your home or your property to make sure there's not a running issue or something like that. Um, we're looking forward to that service upgrade. That's gonna be a really great thing for us on the staff side as well. It's gonna save a lot of staff time, literally hundreds of hours a year. Uh, the equivalent of almost more than an FTE, I think, just based on the billing work alone. Uh, but those together have really become uh, really great internal service upgrades for our customers and residents. And as a practical matter, that's a real service because when I do get those calls, it's They're someone that's got a thousands of dollars. And sometimes I've got a couple of ten and fifteen thousand dollar water bills that you know they were away for months, not knowing. Um, we try not, obviously, to make that the village's problem, um, but um, at the end of the day, the village does have to respond, and so if we have this, uh, that's a real practical uh, service to the public because when something goes awry, it, it has been for big dollars in the past. Yes? Will the AMI have a way of, like, you know, sometimes they say your past usage was this much or this is your annual usage and this is more than normal or compared with your neighbors so that people know what is normal and what is not? Yeah, it's going to have the ability for us to provide that report. We've looked at um, some what I'll call public-facing portals. So I live in Downers Grove. They have something called Avalara. Uh -huh. um, WaterSmart, I think, we have a layer of WaterSmart, so you can do that online. Okay. Um, I think we might look at that going forward. The problem with those is they tend to be expensive and a very low percentage of the population usually uses it, 10, 15 okay. percent. But those are reports we can run, you know, if someone wants to call in once we have this up and running and say, it's my normal bill, we can get that in two seconds for you and email that over. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Question. On the uh, PAYGO financing approach, which I love, it does seem to be front-loaded. Is there a reason why you front-loaded versus having a level across uh, those years? The, the main reason is because there was work we needed to get done right away. Um, we always could push work out, but we have entire neighborhoods running on one pipe. Okay. So that was the main issue. We actually looked at that with the Water Committee is could we go out a little bit? And honestly, it didn't make a lot of difference just because uh, we do need to generate some cash up front to begin to yep. tackle some of these two, three million dollar projects. Versus taking on debt. Correct. Got it. Yeah, that's the other mantra. Yep. We can fund it and we don't want to take on the debt. Right. Even though we have the best bond rating you can get as a municipality. Yes. Yeah, so the Water Committee, Committee did spend a lot of time in reviewing and analyzing various scenarios. <clears throat> uh, there, But when it comes to some areas and some subdivisions that have low water flow for 
uh, fire protection. That's a life safety issue that had to be addressed immediately, immediately if not sooner. Uh, multiple water main breaks and aging infrastructure in certain subdivisions that are in the capital plan. Um, this is all things that need to be addressed. We're a village that's 67 years old now. Some subdivisions are almost that old and they have old water systems and things are, are starting to break more often and we need to be proactive to replace these. Uh, so this is a good path forward. It's cut to the bone as best as we can so that we can still meet the needs of our residents, provide for their safety and well-being, and yet be uh, proactive to any future emergencies and issues that, that may arise, and they will arise. So it's just a matter of time. Thank you. Yeah, and what I hope, and not hope, but I know you're all appreciating is that there has been a real effort put forward to have fiscal planning. Um, again, law of no surprises. We don't want, we're in a very strong fiscal position, and that's, that's the very reason not to get lazy uh, and have a, a program. Um, all of you are business minded here on the board, and so um, I think you're seeing that, uh, that approach and that philosophy come through the staff uh, for the benefit of the uh, residents in this village. Yes, Tony. Yeah, I just want to thank Trustee Frenzies, Bavese, and Snyder for their work. I know how I know how these meetings go, and you know you're always keeping the residents top of mind. And uh, sometimes there are some tough de decisions, uh, especially with raising rates. But you know, as Trustee Frenzies had explained, as life safety and, and service providing to the residents that we have to uh, provide. So thank you again, Trustee Frenzies. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Now done. All we need is a motion to direct us to prepare that ordinance, and we'll begin to communicate the increases to our residents as soon as we can. Okay. So can I get a motion to um, direct staff to prepare the ordinance for the five-year water and sewer rate plan that was just discussed? So moved. Second. Any discussion at the board level? Any public comment? Roll call, please. Yes. Trustee Mattel? Yes. Trustee Smith? Yes. Trustee Francis? Yes. Trustee Paveza? Yes. 5 0. 5 0, the motion passes. Um, that will now take us to item 9 public comment. Is there any public comment? There's no public comment. Item 10 reports and communications from village officials. Anyone? Yes, Al? Just a reminder. In March, I think it's March 22nd, the Secretary of State's mobile office will be here. So if anybody has any uh, thing uh, that needs to be done or questions or stickers, whatever you need renewed, they'll be here uh, and they do a good job. Okay, thank you. Yes. So last Tuesday, uh, February 21st, I had the opportunity to speak before the LTHS Board of Education at their um, monthly meeting. Uh, I did read our recently passed resolution in its, in its entirety to the board. I also gave them a copy. And uh, in addition to myself, there are other officials from other villages there, uh, notably Countryside had two trustees there. Also Pleasantdale District 107 Board of Education had three, two trustee, two Board of Education members and the Board of Education president speaking, all speaking out in support of the Willow Springs a zoning vision for the LTHS property, Willow Springs Road and 79th Street. Um, as you know, uh, all, all the folks are speaking on behalf of supporting the vision that uh, encourages single family, residential, light retail and senior living at that site. And all, in addition, it also uh, is in opposition to any type of industrial development there. I'm equally impressed and proud as to how the Burr Ridge residents uh, who have come out to support the Willow Springs vision and speak out on behalf of the vision and also to what they can do to protect their children who are attendees at, uh, L at Pleasantdale District 107 Elementary School, which borders the subject property. I'm told by the district superintendent, P uh, Pleasantdale District Superintendent 107, there are 292 Burridge residents that attend that school that would be directly affected by the construction of a potential industrial development there. So I want to bring the board up to date on that and thank you again for your support. Thank you for attending. Right. Um, anyone else? Right. 
Reports and communications, uh, stay tuned for announcements about uh, the 5K this spring, um, Armed Forces Day on May 20th, and the concert series, which will be every Thursday, month of June and July. Uh, staff is working hard, uh, planning everything for you, and enjoy the good weather that we're having right now. Unseasonably warm, but no one's complaining. No one's complaining. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, just a couple things from me. Um, uh, Jean Osgood, one of our residents, um, informed me that um, Mary uh, Rinison, Rinison um, who lived on 62nd Street for most of her life, uh, died last Tuesday at the age of 106. Oh my goodness. I just before I got here, I saw a little special on nightly news about uh, Sister Jean at 103, but Mary, Mary did 106. And she was living on her and own? And she's been in, in the Burr Ridge community before there was any harvester or Burr Ridge. Um, I'm told that she and um, her husband, John, who predeceased her, uh, have been living uh, around the 62nd Street area for most of those years. Uh, her property was at 62nd and Garfield uh, in a then bungalow uh, with a chicken coop and an old farm latrine and even uh, a traditional Ukrainian barn. So um, Mary's parents uh, bought this land and, uh, and lived in that bungalow since she was age 13, around 1929. So uh, we lost a real fixture in uh, uh, Mary, but uh, 106. And I'm told that she was still had it all at 106. Mm -hmm. So. Um, thank you to Jean Osgood for letting me know so I could let everybody else know. Um, what a wonderful story. Um, I, uh, about 14 years ago, uh, took up the task of um, trying to look uh, get a zip code for uh, Burr Ridge. I failed uh, then, uh, but I've decided to take up the, the mantle again, uh, which means I've asked Evan uh, to get the staff involved uh, in trying to do it. I've reached out to Mayor Trilla um, and um, already given him a heads up uh, and asked him if his board would likely uh, uh, pass a resolution supporting uh, Burridge separate zip code uh, if we're able to pull that off. Of course, Mayor Trilla thought his board would be fully supportive. So I'm going to try again. Um, I think uh, I can make a strong case why we should have it. It's, it's not a big problem for the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, but uh, Burridge, it's long overdue that we have our own zip code, and I'm going to try to take that on one more time. Uh, Evan's been doing such a great job. I'm going to throw it at him, and we'll see if we can get this one done, too. So um, uh, with that, can I get a motion to adjourn to one quick Yep, yeah, one thing. Yes, no, thank you. I um, do want to make a quick note. If, I'm sure most of you heard there was a, a tragic death of a public employee in Westmont the other day. Um, unfortunately, a 20-year-old water employee drowned in a water main break. Very, very unfortunate. Um, investigation is still ongoing. Um, just wanted to let the board and the public know we've spoken to staff. I uh, wanted to thank Dave for taking that on. It was last Thursday afternoon, Friday morning at 7 o'clock. Dave was in front of everybody reinforcing the need for safety. We're going to look at all of our training again. I know our training's up to date. We've already kind of talked to Irma about that, our, our risk management provider. But um, safety is most important to us and our staff, no matter what line of work or section of the village you work in, um, it can happen. Um, and that's something we take very seriously. Uh, we're very, we have a highly trained workforce. You're going to see a significant amount of training in our budget, which comes out at the end of this week. Um, that is dollars that ultimately go towards uh, making things work. Uh, but I do want to extend my condolences to the village of Westmont, uh, the bereaved family, and the uh, whole staff over there. I'll communicate with the village manager, my counterpart. but. Um, just wanted to communicate that to the board. That's something we take seriously um, and just something we're going to be focusing on going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Okay, with that, can I get a motion to adjourn to March 13 at um, 6 p.m.? Because we will be starting our budget process. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you very much.